Um, the session is actually going to be recorded um, and uh, the notes will be shared uh, post um, the session. So feel free um, to take notes and subsequent notes will be followed. If you have any concerns or questions, um, we'll share our contact and you can follow through with us. Um, Jenny, you can introduce yourself uh, as before we proceed. Morgan? Thanks, yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as Kwaku mentioned, I am co-facilitating. Um, I am a project support officer at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, this session is hosted by the ARA and will examine the co-creation process, highlight the outputs and opportunities for collaboration. We're joined by three panelists whom we'll be introducing shortly, but before we get into into all of the good fun um just wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping it would be great if you wouldn't mind just staying muted there'll be time for questions but if anything pops into your head before then feel free to use the chat um as as quick already mentioned the session will be recorded and we'll be sharing that around later um we will be using a mirror board which the link will be um also um, added to the chat here shortly um but in the meantime, it would be great to get a sense of who's in the room. So if you wouldn't mind just putting your, your name and affiliated organization into the chat, um, yeah, it'd be great to get to know one, of you, one another. Um, Kweku, back over to you. Um, thank you very much. I mean, there's something that I think we did not capture during our preparation. That is the, I noticed a number of um, AIs joining, um, which may distort the realities of who is actually in the room. So. Um, if it's possible, you can take out your AI um, and be present during this particular session. We'll be pretty much excited to have that because we are solicited your input on a number of things. Um, as we indicated, our session is going to be an interactive session to ensure that we can capture your inputs and your insights um, as experts in the field. So if we have an AI on board, unfortunately, it might not give a true reflection of what you are thinking. So please try as much as possible to minimize your AI participation in today's session. Um, as Morgan um, indicated, today we are going to delve into uh, co-creation activities by the Adaptation Research Alliance. Um, we have been on the cutting edge of co-creating um, research impact work across um, the globe. Um, and we have um, developed a few of, of, of the co-creation activities within LDCs, empowering LDC universities in being able to support scientific work um, in various countries that they are based in. And we also have urban resilience. We've also co-created urban resilience work with over um, 250 um, members um, of the Alliance. And we believe that uh, the outputs that we have would be actually useful in supporting a number of research impact um, framings um, for adaptation research work um, across the globe. So this particular engagement that we're going to have, um, we tried as much as possible to assemble the experts to speak on the subject. So I wouldn't really dive much into the meat of today's work. I will just give a short um, overview as in um, the agenda for today. Um, Diana, if you can go to the next slide for me to actually just take uh, participants through today's agenda. So we don't have a lengthy period, but we want to make sure we have a very productive um, session, um, which will be touching on accelerating smallholder agriculture adaptation, which we'll be taking, um, we'll be taking you through by Jesse. Um, He's the head of Adaptation Research Alliance. He would take him his time to actually properly introduce himself. Um, we will also be followed by an interactive um, session, which we've actually properly we put it put it on hold or aside just to make sure that we do not take away the excitement within that particular activity. Um, and it will be followed by also enhancing the role of LDC universities in national ad adaptation research work that was done by Interfe, UNDP, and a number of stakeholders in trying to support Southern-based um, researchers um, to be able to support policy 
um, in, to influence policy in adaptation and to be able to also contribute towards global processes around climate change adaptation. Uh, the details will be um, on mass or uh, shared during um, the, 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 the presentation. And also the co-creation work that ARA has supported over the years, um, led by IIED, um, one of our Alliance members. Uh, the presentation would be done by Alejandro. Um, he's an urban expert. I will let him also introduce himself extensively. And again, we will have a final reflection session. But as we proceed, we also have a session for observations and reflections. So anything that you pick up in our presentation, we may, which may not fall within these three main categories of activities, but may have some relevance, um, you can actually we'll give you the opportunity to also highlight that in our reflection and observation session on our mirror board um, activity. So um, we try in as much as possible to have almost, as I speak now, 65 participants on board when we try in as much as possible to make sure that the session runs as interactive as possible. But again, I don't want the conversation to be too much of talk. I want it to be do more of action. So before I set the ball rolling, I will invite the head of Adaptation Research Alliance, um, Jesse, to again introduce himself and set the scene for ARS co-creation space work um, that has been ongoing for some years now. And he will be able to give you the background and the roots and the and 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 what is it called? The foresight of that particular um, space. So Jesse, without much I speak, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kweku and Morgan. Um, and Kweku, I think you've set a quite high bar here in what I'm going to be doing at the very start here um, to this ARA session here on the Gobi Shona Conference. Um, but you're right that what I do want to do here is set a bit of a framing of what uh, co-creation means within the ARA. And actually, before I do that, just to say that it's really wonderful to see the turnout that we have here and also to see so many members who are joining us. Um, the ARA has come to the Gobe Shona Conference for the past three years since its founding and even came together on the Gobe Shona Declaration, so it's really great to be back here. Um, and just to maybe mention that, of course, um, Professor Salim al Hook um, was a steering board member and, of course, the driver behind Gopa Shona and many other climate action initiatives throughout the world and particularly in, in the Global South. So it's really great to be here and carry on that spirit in an approach that, um, that Salim would really support, of course, which is co-creation. And with that, I'd just like to move in a bit to how the ARA sees co-creation and to say that when we talk about the area's co-creation spaces, it doesn't mean that the other work that we're doing is not co-creation or co-production. In fact, the idea of co-creation and collaboration really underpins uh, the Alliance and all of the work itself. And the six adaptation research for impact principles um, could very well and very easily be drawn across into co-creation or co-production principles. Those are available on the website. Um, so if you want to see that, you can you can go look on those, but I won't go into them here. But if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm still, maybe I'm seeing a lag here. I see the welcome. If we can go one more forward to looking at, there we go. So what is co-creation here in the Adaptation Research Alliance? And what we want to hear is, is show how it relates to five key areas. Um, as you see on the screen here. And then after, as Kweku mentioned, we'll dive into three specific co-creation activities that we have carried out and actually are continuing to carry out um, this year. So first about co-creation is to say, and importantly here, as the Alliance wants to bring together diverse members, co-creation actually empowers diverse stakeholders. Um, so you can see here we have a variety of names of the types of stakeholders that are part of the Alliance and should be a part of these co-creation processes. But I think it's really important just to mention that by involving multiple stakeholders, such as the researchers and practitioners and policymakers, et cetera, um, in design processes, you allow each stakeholder to bring their unique perspectives 
um, to these processes themselves. They bring their perspectives, they bring the knowledge that accompanies that, and they bring the expertise that they have working from whatever their perspective and the worldview that comes in here is, is coming from. Um, and by incorporating these diverse perspectives into an action-oriented research program, it really benefits the program in terms of ensuring a broad range of insights and ideas to help leading up to that uh, program design and eventually leading to more comprehensive and robust outcomes that we'll see here in a second. Second, in terms of en enabling um, collaboration, really just to say here that, as you can see there, bringing together these diverse stakeholders really allows for diverse feedback and then validation of what emerges from processes. And then and through iterative processes, really a refinement of whatever the the priorities that are emerging or refine other methodologies of how best to, to really dig down into earthing, again, the focus of, in this case, an actual entry research program would be, um, and the approaches that, that are used. So this is a critical part to, to bring together different people and really in a meaningful way to ensure a meaningful collaboration of the stakeholders. Um, sorry, I just see something on the screen which is throwing me off. I'm not sure that's coming from. Um, so this is, I think also this collaboration, these diverse stakeholders then also come back to the importance here of, of this strengthens really the integrity and, and increases the standard of the type of programs that could emerge from a co-creation process. Um, this then leads to an enhanced use and impact. So by again, in, involving these stakeholders in a meaningful and collaborative way, it really ensures that the design process of a research program addresses the real world challenges. So you can always, um, cross check these with some of the more academic or scientific questions at hand, but ultimately what we really want to be working towards is, is information and programs that are emerging that is relevant to the needs of the stakeholders and the wider community. So this then follows on to the next of ensuring actionable outcomes um, as outputs are more likely to be relevant and then used as a part of the process. It can have a, a positive impact on the ground as well as in science and academia. And a lot of this, of course, stems from that trust that's enabled um, through these collaborative processes. And within these outcomes, to recognize here that when stakeholders actively participate in these types of, of co-design or co-creation processes, that they actually develop a sense of ownership and investment in the outcomes. So again, this participation fosters a sense of trust and collaboration and commitment amongst those parties involved, the different stakeholders. And then as a, a result of that, um, quite often the research findings and then the recommendations that emerge from it are more likely to be accepted and implemented, whether that's in policy or practice. And maybe just last to, to say here, I think that the aspect of um, capacity building or capacity development here is a critical aspect as new skills and knowledge and understanding amongst these diverse stakeholders can be developed and enhanced. Um, and this can be done as a learning by doing or learning while doing experience that happens while participants are actually evolved in these processes. But co-creation processes can also be designed in ways so they allow for standalone trainings or maybe peer-to-peer -peer learning that allow specific learning moments throughout the co-creation processes themselves. Um, maybe I think lastly, just to say amongst these five different areas, that when we talk about co-creation, we aren't proposing any one specific methodology or any one specific way of doing this, um, which while well, you have these five areas, they can be um, quite general, quite broad, and really depends on the context in which they're actually being delivered. And I think with that, um, I would just like to pause um, to see if Kweku has anything to add, because what we want to do now is really to move into um, these examples of how these five different areas um, can have been being used and being implemented in different co-creation process here within the ARA. Um, Kweku, anything to add here before we move on? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but yeah, so what I wanted to do with, was just allow you to continue with the next um, presentation, which you did. So fortunately, unfortunately, you are the person to present. But um, before we dive into that, um, we would also want to make sure that you are familiar with the kind of acts um, we want from you in terms of the kind of questions that we want you to reflect over as we actually go through the various presentations. Um, we are mindful of the fact that the technology uh, savviness of, of participants is not universal. And for that reason, we should be mindful when we are using these new technologies. So, um, I will ask my colleague to actually post the mirror board um, right now, uh, Matthew. 
Um, and we will take you through the sets of um, questions um, that we have. Um, the link is actually shared right now. Um, and you click on the link and it will take you to um, a screen and it's displaying sets of questions. Uh, please don't be scared. I'll take you through each one of them. It's not nothing strange um, if you know what to do. Um, so this, my screen is actually going to pop up and I'll take you through the quadrant of questions that we have. So we have three presentations of the various co-creation spaces that we have, and we have specific guiding questions that we want you to reflect on as we actually go through the process, the entire process of actually sharing the details with you. Um, Matthew? Yeah, so again, as I guess um, being an IT teacher, I know how technology use might be of a challenge um, in some jurisdictions. Um, so um, please bear with me. Uh, the technology we depend on so much sometimes can fail us. So I hope that, that is not the case today. Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay. And uh, the sharing. Perfect. <sighs> I nearly had a mini heart attack. Okay, so this is fundamentally what you see when you log into the link that has been shared. And we have urban resilience, um, we have smallholder agri, we have um, various titles, empowering LDC universities and general observations on co-creation processes. And as you can see, each of them have specific questions with the exception of the general observations. General observations, as I indicated, it's open for suggestion. Um, so you feel free and make your, uh, and, and add your own input. The various sticky notes you see there, yeah. uh, the boxes you see are sticky notes. So you click on them and they will zoom up and you'll be able to actually type your various questions or your reflection on each of the co-created spaces that have been presented. So in a nutshell, if you have any challenge assessing this particular link, please post it in the chat box and someone will attend to you. However, um, if you are familiar with this particular space, um, it's fine. You can still, still start thinking and reflecting on the questions and start populating it as and when we go through the various presentations. Um, I think we'll stop sharing now and zoom in straight into the um, Accelerating Smallholder Agri session, um, also by Jesse. Jesse, please take over. Um, and you can stop sharing, please. <laughs> Excellent. Um, maybe then if we start to go back and forth here a bit, but we just want to make sure that you're aware of the mirror board and how it works, as Kweku mentioned. Um, but if we can maybe go to the presentation again. Yep. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. So um, first, maybe just to kind of, again, take a step back to where we were and say if, you know, again, I provided a, well, first it's actually that the, the person who's leading within the ARA, um, Julia Rujo on the, the co-creation spaces and the co-creation aspects wasn't able to be here today. So that's why I'm stepping in. You have to hear so much from me, particularly on, on the smallholder ag process. But just remind ourselves, of course, we looked at these five key aspects or considerations to co-creation of the empowering diverse stakeholders, enabling collaboration, um, the fact that it enhances use and impact and ensures actual outcomes, strength and capacities. So and with those in mind, this is the first of the examples of the processes that we wanted to highlight. And as you can see, it's about accelerating smallholder agriculture and adaptation. Uh, and this emerged from consultations that the Secretariat had with members at various points um, throughout the past couple of years. Also from a consultative process that was held um, and carried out by 
the International Development Research Center of Canada, IDRC, who I see some uh, colleagues here. And there's a consultative process on food systems research priorities in the context of climate change. And then also in consultation with one of our members, um, who is also a funder, and this is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So there's really strong interest in and in ensuring that Gates is able to deliver, well, to develop and deliver a program that really meets the needs of those on the ground and those on the front lines of climate change, and particularly within the context of an area that they fund, which is smallholder agriculture. So we started this conversation um, with the Gates Foundation with the recognition that adaptation progress is in particularly in smallholder agriculture is insufficient. Um, of course, adaptation progress across the board um, is also insufficient, has been highlighted in the global stock take. But also that within smallholder agriculture, in many cases, adaptation technologies and products or, or solutions, you know, if they do exist, uh, fail to, to achieve scale. On the other hand, we have the issue that many donors or research efforts aim to support small scale farmers in adaptation, but they, they come in and because of the angle in which they enter and, and create these research programs or agendas, they often lack the local ownership and sometimes even a, a really a sound understanding of what is needed in a local context. And we also know that agriculture research and the research action system needs strengthening so that there's greater capacity on the ground for these ongoing interventions to continue to be able to adapt and to build resilience as the climate continues to change. And the last couple of points is that we really wanted to have systemic or contribute to systemic changes in the agriculture research to use system. Um, but this again goes back to that point of continuities that recognizing that adaptation is not a one time activity um, that we need to actually strengthen that the capacities, but also have these systemic changes brought in. And last is that we really want to bring in local knowledge and voices to identify action oriented research needs. Um, and this is needs for scaling, needs for accelerating, and needs for sustaining adaptation in smallholder agriculture. So the intention here um, is to identify a suite of interventions that can be further funded by the Gates Foundation. And I see the presentation has gone away. If we can put it back up, that would be great. And if not, I can just continue here. Well, maybe I will, I'll continue speaking here until we get to the slide up um, to say that we started off um, this process with a desk-based review, which in, okay, there's, there's a slide, okay. So then again, coming back here to say that, uh, there we go, that slide there, perfect. So the objectives here is that what we want to do is to identify these action um, research priorities within smallholder agriculture, again, to accelerate the, the the smaller agriculture adaptation processes to enhance the effectiveness of adaptation strategies at the national and subnational level, and then to expand the reach of adaptation benefits, particularly at the local level. Um, and again, the objective here is to bring in a wide range of stakeholders to have these processes to carry out the co-creation processes, and to again make sure that this is a transdisciplinary process, bringing in diverse disciplines from science, but also again from research to action. So again, not just multidisciplinary, but pushing into transdisciplinary. And then identify also collectively um, opportunities that really focused on, again, the local priorities, being able to local, uh, being able to leverage local capacities and have this uh, high potential for impact given the, con the contextualization of the potential program here. Um, if we go to the, to the next slide, please. This is a bit about the process itself to say that what we did is we kicked off a process with um, scoping and planning. And this was really a desk-based review, which incorporated um, elements of both scoping reviews and a rapid synthesis, um, which was carried out by the Africa Research and Impact Network or ARIN. Um, and this was a part of the desk-based review, which also included a situational analysis with the aim of, of understanding the potential pathways for a future, for the future of smallholder agriculture. Um, and then this led to an exercise that was working at the country level to identify potential countries that really kind of promised the, the best opportunities um, and in entry points um, to actually enhancing smallholder agriculture through an action-oriented research program. So that's kind of that first box on the left. And where we are now is we've identified two countries um, where we've scoped these programs and these co-creation processes will now move down to the country level. One will be in Kenya and the other will be in Nigeria. 
And what we're doing here is we are finalizing a selection process of both of the in-country leads to undertake these co-creation activities. Um, these activities are really focused around workshops at local, subnational, national levels. But these will be done with complementary activities that are engaging different communities, different stakeholders throughout this research process. Um, and so we're really looking to aim here at identifying new and innovative solutions, as well as leveraging the existing successful practices and policies um, that we feel, and again, people on the ground feel, still have maybe untapped potential. Um, so from the proposals, as I said, we're looking at having a series of workshops, and these will work across levels and bring in priorities from the national adaptation plans, um, as well as priorities from communities and smallholder, smallholder agricultural collectives. Um, so again, bringing the national to local here. And some of the, elef uh, the elements that we're using to, to, to frame some of this planning and to look into kind of interrogating further through these different workshops, through these co-creation processes, are really exploring um, ways that the priorities interact with and depend on enabling and scaling signals and also with potential strategies such as financial products or markets or advisories, um, maybe going into behavior change if needed. And of course, the policies um, that already are there and influence or incentivize um, or even dissuade uh, adaptation, particularly small drug adaptation um, activities. Another area that we're looking to is really to explore ongoing in-country and international research activities. Um, what are some of the interests? What are the capacities in country related to some of the priorities that emerge? And then how can we look into enabling and scaling some of these approaches within the, the research to action space? Um, looking into prioritize concrete action research ideas and potential partners, again, at these various levels that could help us respond to these priority needs and some of the cap capabilities that come out. Um, and then identify what could be implemented and looking at the capacity in country again at these various levels. And then last to say that um, also looking into potential practical business models um, and looking at delivery models and scaling pathways and, and seeing what could be used, what could be leveraged and what would be the best ways to actually unlock the potential to scale um, some of these adaptation strategies again with smallholder agricultures in the two countries. Um, also to say, because this will be an iterative process, because this will be led by an in-country lead with diverse stakeholders, we'll be establishing uh, an advisory committee who's going to help us provide strategic guidance. So it won't be the in-country lead who makes the final decisions. It won't be the ARA secretary who makes the final decisions, but it'll actually be an advisory committee to help us, um, help us make sense and really to provide the strategic steer for the best way that these processes could happen. And again, one committee will be established in Kenya and one in Nigeria. Maybe last, just to say, um, in terms of the timelines, we're expecting to start this month. Um, Kenya is just about to kick off. Nigeria, we're still working on, and we aim to complete by the end of November this year. So on the first two parts of the screen, you can see the blue boxes, I guess. But on the right, you can see there's just circles that say activity research area one, two, three. It's because these are the areas that we're looking to go create and to prioritize coming out of here. So with that, um, We'll stop here. And this is really just kind of a, a, a taster and a test of what we want to do, because the other co-creation processes are at a point where we really need your feedback and your inputs. But this one here, we can use some of your, your reflections and inputs here. So we'd like to move to our first mirror board here to get some of your reflections on a couple of questions that we've posed. So if we go to the next question, or I'm sorry, the next slide, you can see the questions here. And we will just spend a little bit of time on this to, to trial your skills on the mirror board, and then we can move into longer discussions with the other two co-creation spaces. Um, but the questions we have here for you within this context of smallholder agriculture is first, what adaptation challenges and solutions or strategies are most critical for smallholder agriculture in, in this case, Kenya or Nigeria, or a particular farming system? When we are looking at farming, I'm sorry, smallholder agriculture, we are talking about um, across the entire farming system. So we're not just limiting it to anyone in the area, including fisheries, um, you know, could be included as well as, as livestock. And then also the second question here is what adaptation solutions or strategies provide the greatest promise um, or benefits? So with that, if you direct your attention to the Miro board, and I'll pass back to Queco here to help us um, lead on this piece. But Queco, back to you for <laughs> a little bit of information here on the questions about smaller agriculture. I see we already have 
the board getting active, which is great. Yes, yes. Uh, I could see a number of people are getting active and busy um, trying to complete the Mirabal. Um, so the question again is what adaptation challenges and solutions strand or strategies are most critical for smallholder agri holders in your geography? I mean, smallholder agri, it's not peculiar to just Africa. Smallholder agri, um, it's, it's in Asia, you find smallholder agri practices across the continent. And uh, what are some of the major um, adaptation challenges that potentially could, could have been faced uh, based on the farming systems? And what adaptation solutions and strategies uh, presents the most promise? Um, I've had the opportunity of actually listening through, uh, sit through some of these um, smallholder agri farmer conversations and sometimes it's about indigenous seeds and the fear of use of um, chemicals and fertilizers and all that to potentially are kind of undermining their farming practices, soils losing um, value and all that over time based on its commercial use. So again, um, what potentially could be the challenges in your geography that potentially can actually help us or learn, we can learn from to inform our co-creation processes as we proceed. Um, those of you who do not have access to or just join, um, the link is actually shared in the um, in the chat box. You can click on it and make your inputs um, um, here. I will give you about maybe in the next, how many minutes, Jesse, should we? Do we have five more minutes here before we proceed to the next slide? Because I noticed that um, with the challenges that abound, a lot of people actually can associate more with the challenges than um, the solutions. And please don't look at the bleak side, look at the positive side. It's important for us to also be thinking more about the positive things that uh, indigenous knowledge can actually contribute to shaping some of these research processes. Um, I know that there's a lot of place-based knowledge that uh, often do not filter through scientific processes that small holder farmers are literally sitting on. And I think that these are the kind of knowledge systems that we want to tap into to support adaptation, especially locally-based adaptation process. We want local communities to lead their own adaptation processes. I believe most of you may have heard about most of you are advocate for addressing local solutions, uh, local problems with local solutions. And so we are actually advocating for more of these kind of solutions and strategies that can be shared across the world. Um, I, I believe in the power of humanity and human experiences that have prevailed over thousands of years. And for us to find any amicable solutions to our adaptation challenges, I think that the answers just lie within our own communities. So draw on that kind of knowledge that you have to share. There's no knowledge that is waste of knowledge. I mean, it all boils down to where you use that knowledge. So um, I would always advocate for indigenous place-based knowledge, local-based knowledge to support our thinking and our processes. With regards to the scientific knowledge, yes, we can learn, we can adapt, we can bring them. It can help us shape um, the way we conduct research differently. So it's important to think and rethink hard. It's not always about the textbook knowledge. It's not always about the academic knowledge. It's also about the experiential knowledge we get by the various farmers who are on the ground, by the various communities who are on the ground who are actually facing the threat of drought uh, who have drought resistant seeds um, that they are using to enable them to cope uh, with extreme floods and all that. So it's important, how do communities mobilize themselves against um, um, the impact of climate change on, 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 on their, bio, their own local biodiversity? All these things, what are the nature-based solutions that are adopted by locally led uh, smallholder agric 
um, communities. Um, these are all practices and approaches. I, I mean, growing up, I knew about, um, what is it called? They call it community-based um, agri, where communities actually farm pieces of plots as communities. Uh, they share crops, they share labor, they share quite a number of expertise across their own experiences. They share seeds, they share good breeding, um, poultry, and all that, yes. Um, yes, I'll let Jesse come in here. Jesse, please. Great, thank you very much, Kweku. I just wanted to come in um, because I saw a question here in the chat. Um, mm. And this is saying here that um, from um, Kristen Corbett from IDRC, just asked me about the time that went into the process. Um, of the two country level engagements. So to highlight that those processes are actually kicking off now. So we're anticipating um, going from March until November. Originally, uh, we did hope to leave 10 months. Visioning about 10, 10 to 12 months, um, just to give you an idea of that. So the previous step that has actually been done um, was more the desk review and kind of situating all this plus recruitment of the country leads, et cetera. So, um, which is being finalized around that final step of that recruitment. I hope that Perfect. helps to clarify. And just maybe with that, I'll just say that, you know, the inputs that I see here are quite, um, quite interesting, quite useful, and we will certainly take these and pass these on um, to the, the two country leads, because again, these, these are not necessarily Kenya or Nigeria specific, but at the same time, as Kweku was saying, a lot of these challenges are shared across um, countries, across agroecological systems, across um, food systems, et cetera. So um, we can definitely share this and what came out of here, um, but also to say thank you very much. And um, I think it'd be great maybe quick if we move on to the next, because I think we have also a lot more to, to hear from everybody here in terms of the other co-creation processes. All right, so I think um, I would let my co-host Jenny introduce the next speaker, um, um, at least not to ensure that we have some balance here. <laughs> I don't want you to only see my face. So thank you very much for being such a great audience. Um, we look forward to interacting more um, after um, the previous presentations. Thank you, Kweku and Jesse. Um, yeah, really wonderful start to the panel session. Um, I am gonna gear us now towards our second panelist, who is Liam Fee, um, an adaptation planning specialist from the United Nations Development Program. And uh, Liam will be presenting on enhancing the role of LDC universities in national adaptation action. Liam, um, please yeah, um, feel free to introduce yourself and um, Let's get into your panel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, you've introduced me uh, fantastically. I don't know if I can say anything more about myself, and perhaps it's more interesting to talk about our co-creation. Um, should I, just to clarify, should I share the presentation, or will you do it from your end? Um, feel free to share the presentation. You should be able Yes, to you can share. I will. Just give me one second, then I will put it on the screen. So I, I hope you can now see my screen. Perhaps you can shout at me if you do not. Um, so yes, I am going to present, um, hopefully quite briefly, the enabling universities to contribute to national adaptation action, co-creation work that we have done. But let me just say before I do, thank you to um, the ARA Secretariat um, for giving me the opportunity to present. It's an honor to be at Gobashona. This is my first Gobashona. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, to have the opportunity to present this work to you. And let me just, perhaps before I get into the nuts and bolts of the co-creation that we've done, let me just give um, a sort of overview of where we UNDP were sort of coming to this co-creation from. So UNDP has been um, a major provider of technical support to both national adaptation planning and the NDC process. Um, 32 of the 53 countries that have submitted a NAP to the UNFCCC 
um, were supported by UNDP and through the climate promise um, or UNDP's climate promise, um, support has been provided to 120 countries, including 40 LDCs, to enhance the adaptation ambition in their in their NDCs. So we have come at this process from from a position of being a a, a provider of technical support to the the policy making uh, process. But to try to set the scene um, about the you know the the, the co-creation work itself um this commitment that the countries have undertaken towards naps and ndcs and enhancing their adaptation ambition i think reflects a, a universal concern that climate change is a significant threat that hinders the potential of countries to achieve their sdg targets uh, undp has been a member of the ara since its um, foundation in 2021 and Together with the ARA Secretariat, South South North, and the LDC Universities Consortium on Climate Change, I think we sort of shared this view that LDC universities can play a pivotal role in supporting and enabling adaptation actions because they drive the research and knowledge agenda, can document best practices, traditional knowledge, cutting edge practices, new technologies, and they can support monitoring, evaluation, and learning. So there is a lot of potential here for universities to add value to the policy process. But what we also, I think, agreed upon is that there's a persistent science policy practice gap, um, including a lack of locally led research, especially in these developed countries. So therefore, there is a need to close this gap while enhancing the capacity of LDC universities to continue um, to support adaptation planning and policy. And this is what drove UNDP, the ARA, the LUC, and other stakeholders to engage in this co-creation process. And this presentation, I will briefly frame um, the outcomes of that process. So just to build on what Jesse was saying about the nature of co-creation, um, this was a process that's taken almost a year. Um, it engaged with around 200 people from 25 different countries. Um, the process was facilitated by South South North as the ARA Secretariat. Um, it was actually led by an organization called Interfer, um, which is based in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. It held stakeholder uh, consultation workshops at the Community-Based Adaptation um, Conference in, in Thailand, the Resilience Evidence Forum in South Africa, and Adaptation Futures as well as undertaking key informant interviews with um, key personnel from universities in least developed countries and having um, consultation sessions in um, in a number of least developed countries. And the, the, the key point here through this rather complex but beautiful diagram, I think, is to say that um, this was not just a, a consultative process. This was a co-creation, right? This was what, what I'm about to present here was um, arose as a result of, of all of this um, process that we undertake to, to engage these stakeholders in a very deep way. So um, that kind of problem statement arose here, which was basically to, 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 to boil it down into bullet points. It was a fragmented knowledge system with limited means and platforms to connect between different uh, knowledge holders and policy makers in the country, a lack of access to data, um, a lack of university capacity to focus on research and consultancy tasks as opposed to teaching, which in and of itself may not be a problem. Teaching is obviously valuable, but um, there was yeah, a, a lack of capacity to engage in the, in the time-consuming research and consultancy type assignments. And a problem in the way that adaptation planning and policies in LDCs is funded. So if you just go to the NAPS, for example, I think just about all of the NAPs and certainly all of the NAPs from least developed countries were funded with donor support. And that support was essential. I don't think we'd have that many submissions without that support, but it, it tends to lead to a, a model that doesn't necessarily include universities from least developed countries. And throughout this process, we, we tried to maintain a series of values. We didn't want to impose a, a, a set of solutions on the process, but we did try to keep this these set of values that guided it, which is a whole of society approach, locally led solutions, research building as as a prior uh, relationship building as a priority, avoiding duplication, multi-directional knowledge sharing, flexible and culturally relevant, 
and recognizing complexity. So those were the values that we tried to maintain. Um, throughout the, the, the process, what we also tried to do, led by Interfo, was to uh, examine solutions that are being undertaken by other actors. And basically, this was done by looking at different types of stakeholders, which you see in this slide, and analyzing the, the types of activities that they're trying to do. One is to understand what is being done at the moment, and another use of this is to avoid um, duplication. And what this led to this process was this overarching theory of change. And again, this is quite, quite complicated, and I, I think these slides can be shared. Um, but let me just pick on um, the problem I've outlined, but the overarching program uh, objectives were to um, basically develop new evidence, um, locally led evidence um, that can be fed into adaptation planning and policy processes, and to build the capacity of, of different actors to work together in bridging this um, divide. Um, the values I think I've spoken about, the areas of activity I'm going to dig into in the next couple of slides, but the impact here or the intended impact is basically improve capacity for multiple stakeholders to access and utilize information that national climate change adaptation policy and practice reflects local needs and experiences and a strengthen climate change adaptation knowledge system in these developed countries. So what came out in terms of activities, and I'm not going to go into this in, in, in great detail because it's quite complicated, but basically is what we're framing as three concepts. Now, just before I explain these in brief, these, this is not to say that three projects will arise from this, and it's not to say that the concepts are mutually exclusive. We may end up with a program that has elements of all three of the concepts, or at least more than one. Um, but these are rather different ways that we're thinking about framing the, the action that arises from this. So the, com the concept number one is um, centers of excellence. So basically, um, developing a hub or hubs in, in countries that gather together all of the knowledge and expertise, or at least as much as possible, and, and putting that in a, in a center of excellence that can be the go-to place for both policymakers, researchers, and anyone else who wants to access the knowledge system in that country. Now, that would require quite some support to build up those, those um, centers. Some countries have this more than others, uh, but that was the first approach. The second approach would be to undertake specific sort of research projects under the guidance of a, a research chair, which would be a senior academic who would kind of oversee this research. Um, but this would allow us to go kind of deeply into um, different types of research, whether that's engineering solutions, whether it's documenting indigenous knowledge and traditional practices, whether it's monitoring evaluation of of adaptation implementation, the, the, the process doesn't predetermine what these research projects would be. These would be based on the country priorities, but a much more research project uh, oriented approach. And the final approach would be um, an international approach, um, a little bit based on the um, sort of organizational model of the LUC, the LDC University Consortium on Climate Change. And this would basically be a way of networking universities across least developed countries. Again, that doesn't preclude um, elements of co concepts number one and two, but these are the these are the concepts that have come out of the co-creation process. So uh, this is my second to last slide, and I will I will stop talking soon because I'd very much like to hear from from the people in the room. Um, but moving forward, where where do we go from here, and where are we now? Well, countries have not yet been selected for this. We've we've had consultations with with countries, as I mentioned, but that does not necessarily mean we will work with those countries. And what we want to do is to have further discussions with governments and universities in these developed countries to really see where the willingness is to engage in this going forward. Discussion with donors is ongoing. We do not have a donor in place for this at the minute. It's obviously very important to, to, to get funding behind this work that we, that we hope to do. And detailed project design is still is still needed. So we would still need to put these concepts into a results framework. We would still need to develop a budget. 
Um, and I think we would also likely, given the complexity of this work working in multiple countries, we would need to put together a consortium of implementing partners. So these, these items are still to do and have not been done yet, or at least are ongoing. So I've put two questions in the in the mirror board. Um, the first is, is a rather long winded question, but basically we're asking what are the entry points? You know, where do you think we should take this work and how do we move it forward? Um, you know, and that can include anything from who are the stakeholders that we may still wish to talk to? Um, are there, you know, should we engage in discussions with government? Should we get university partners sort of on side and firmed up? You know, how should we move this forward? And anything in that, um, under that broad range of questions, I, I would really like to hear. And, and secondly, which donors and funders do you think uh, may be interested in this work and, and how can we go about having those um, conversations? But that said, I would also welcome any other experience that you feel uh, may be relevant to this um, to this co-creation. So I spoke for 12 minutes when I said I'd speak for 10. So let me let me stop there and uh, maybe we can move to the mirror board, but I can also take some questions as well if that's um, what people would like to hear. Thank you very much. Thanks, Liam. Yes, I'm just going to highlight the um, the mirror board again. Um, and I think a colleague, Diana, will be able to put the the link into the chat just in case you're you're joining us just now. Um, Liam, there is a chat or a question in the chat that perhaps you might want to come in on. I'm not sure if this relates directly to um, LDC universities, but Anu from uh, Nepal Water Conservation has a query on how we can ensure the youth engagement in activities so that it can be sustainable. Um, do you have any thoughts on this while people um, work on the mural board? Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Yes. Um, I, I don't have specific thoughts. I think anything that involves universities should should inherently involve students. And I think that that is the most obvious the entry point to me in terms of how we engage with with youth um, it's a shame i don't think anyone from interfer is here um, to describe what was done in terms of the co-creation process so far and how youth were engaged um, but I'd be, I'd be happy to sort of link you up and we can get back to you on that but yes i think absolutely I, you know what i would what i would love to see here in an ideal world is that you know, if we're undertaking research projects on, on any element of adaptation, whether that's traditional knowledge, whether that's um, technological approaches, whether that's monitoring, evaluating and learning from adaptation actions that have been implemented, I would really, really like to see, um, you know, not just eminent researchers, but also students engaged in that. And I think that would be a really, um, you know, vital and unique uh, aspect of this. And I can see some, um, I don't know if there are any more uh, questions, Morgan, but I see some activity on the board here, lots of uh, cursors whizzing around. So uh, <laughs> no direct questions that I can see. Okay. And um, Anu, I hope that was a, a good answer um, and definitely an interesting one. Um, yes, a lot happening on the mirror boards. Thank you so much for populating this. And as could I, could yes. I sorry, Morgan, I'm, I'm sorry that I cut you off. That was very rude. But could I, someone has put a, a, a note here that says vertical university model approach well for mountain context. And I, I don't mean to pick on that person. Uh, please only come in if you're, if you're comfortable. But could I actually ask a question what the vertical university? <coughs> Uh, concept is. Um, and so I'm sorry to pick on you, whoever wrote that. You feel free to write in the chat if you don't feel comfortable speaking, but I would really like to know a bit more about what a vertical university model is. Liam, uh, Liam uh, it's, it's Shachi here, and uh, I'm the one who wrote that uh, couple of uh, notes. And I'm the Secretariat Lead of the Himalayan University Consortium, a network of 107 universities in eight countries in the Hindu Kush Himalayan, ranging from Afghanistan to Myanmar. So that's a bit about myself. Now, vertical university concept is actually applicable to the mountain for the reason that, of course, you know, we have the altitude from 
900 meters above the sea level all the way up to perhaps uh, 2,500 or sometimes 3,000 uh, meters uh, above the sea level. So this is a literal vertical in terms of altitude. Now, what we actually did do is starting from uh, the valley uh, and work it up all the way to the high altitude in terms of biodiversity, in terms of the, the diversity of language, uh, cultures, religion, uh, farming systems, you name it. Basically, it is actually a learning lab. If you just take that uh, cut in terms of altitude. And by university, we actually do not do not mean university per se. Actually, it is the entire open learning lab. For anyone who is involved, you know, from the kindergarten uh, school kids, K to 12, uh, all the way to, of course, you know, tertiary education and, of course, um, policy makers. And by policy makers, uh, government officials, we're actually working with sub-national level, meaning district level, provincial level, because we find this level of engagement is critical. Because if you're doing the down... Uh, downscaling and now we are going for one square kilometers in terms of uh, the data, then exactly the district and province, actually the district level is actually correspond squarely with that one square kilometers. So we mm. find that we must work with the district level because they are actually the decision maker that make the kind of budgetary and action that matters to resilience building. So again, I can share more. I don't want to take more time of, uh, of the forum. But then I realized that if we use vertical university as a metaphor, you know, you let's say, you know, it can flat out in terms of uh, the coastland, my country, uh, I'm Roger from Vietnam. And I realized that even in the small island con context or even the coastline, it is applicable as well. If you think of, you know, mangroves, if you think of uh, any other context, it could be a metaphor of thinking in terms of, you know, from the, the local level, um, the education in terms of K-12 to policymakers. And this is back to your point, an earlier point of the previous speaker in terms of adaptation and where the entry point, uh, how to work with uh, policy engagement and action. Uh, back to you, over to you. Thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. And um, yeah, really, really, yeah, great to hear about. Uh, so thank you so much for coming off mute and sharing that with us. Um, I do see a couple of questions in the chat, but for sake of time, Liam, can I ask you to write to them directly? Um, is there any, um, uh, any final thoughts on the first section? Because I would also really encourage you to think about the second, um, in which we're asking which donors and funders may be interested in this work. Um, if there's any that you'd previously worked with or kind of um, new agendas that are coming to the forefront of different um, donors, it would be great to hear more about that. So just kindly shift attention that way. Um, and um, give you maybe another 30 seconds or so. I'm conscientious of time and I know we have one more amazing panel to go through. Um, so I will just leave that here and then Liam, yet, um, Nihar and Chelsea both have some questions there, if you wouldn't mind addressing. Yeah. Would you, shall I briefly say it now, Morgan, or would you like me to write? Yeah, to... go for it. I think if you wouldn't mind just doing both, that would be great. Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, so firstly to, to Chelsea, um, uh, was there any discussion about how the research topics could be determined? Um, the, the short answer to that is no. We, we want to determine research topics in conjunction with the countries and universities. So that might be different by country. We, we're not trying to sort of predetermine it has to be about topic A or B or C. We, we want that to be a very country um, driven, you know, action. And then to um, Mihir Joshi, um, wondering if you're also measuring how research is influencing practice. That's a very good question. 
Um, the, the short answer to that is no, not yet. Um, however, I think whichever of these concepts moves forward or combination of the concepts, measuring measuring that, measuring how research is influencing policy and practice is, is something that we're going to have to build into the detailed project design. And this is exactly the kind of detail work that still needs to be done going forward. Let me stop there, Morgan, so as to not take up too much time, but I'd be happy if anyone has any further questions, I'm happy to answer on the chat. I'll be here throughout. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liam. And yeah, really, really appreciate the questions. Um, please do keep them coming. The chat is open. Um, Kweku, I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce our third panelist. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Liam, for that insightful presentation. Um, I think uh, I'm ready to introduce the next speaker, um, Alejandro. Um, who is actually a researcher at um, IRED. Um, he will actually introduce himself in details. Um, Alejandro, if you would, yes, you have the co-host right, and you can share your slides. But before you dive into, kindly tell us a bit about yourself before you do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kweku, and thanks all of you for being with us today here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex Basena. I'm a researcher uh, in the International Institute for Environment and Development. My focus is on urban resilience and urban risk. And I have been focused on this um, topic for the last uh, uh, 15 years. I have um, very much, I have, I have been very much interested in issues around governance, urban governance, and also around um, risk modeling and how these two can be combined and brought together to put at the center of urban planning the concerns and risk of more mar most marginalized communities. So within the scope of this uh, work, uh, my colleague Morgan and also my colleague uh, Aditya Bahadur, who is not uh, with us today here, but has also been working on this subject for the last um, year and three months at the moment. We've been um, developing the work that I, I'll be delighted to share with you today. So if you may allow me to share my screen and some of you can actually thumbs me up to tell me that everything is uh, visible. So this work fundamentally has focused on the idea of co-creating um, urban resilience. And as you can see on the subtitle of this uh, presentation, what I'm particularly interested, what we are particularly proud uh, of um, and it underpins the work that we've done, we have done is basically developing a framework that allows us to produce contextual solutions for urban resilience. And these particular contextual solutions will be informed by the power and politics that operate in cities. And we argue that this will be fundamental for program design. And I will go forward and explain why this is so exciting. Great. So I think many of us basically are aware of the big challenge, but also the big opportunity that is coming up in the coming 50, 60 years around the issue of urban resilience and urbanization as a whole. So we know basically that uh, currently most of the world population lives in cities, but this is going to continue to be the trend in the coming 30, 50 years. And we're gonna be cities being, uh, we're gonna be seeing cities in Africa rapidly urbanizing in this coming 30 years, um, which actually is an opportunity because this allows us to even prevent the production of the risk that goes into the particular types of urbanization that are going to happen, be happening in there. But also it's a challenge. Um, very vulnerable populations are increasingly getting living in these cities. We're seeing informal settlements bringing populations from rural areas that are living in informal settlements, highly exposed to uh, growing disasters like floods and um, uh, sea level rise, heat waves, for instance. Um, this also goes accompanied with uh, the exposure of major investments in infrastructure that are being built and will be built in this coming 30 years. So this simultaneously is a challenge, many people, many investments, but also it's an opportunity because this is actually going to happen. So how we deal with this, how we basically capitalize on this opportunity, how we, do we prevent 
mm, the possibility of this challenge to become real um, is actually complicated. Some some of us has actually called it a wicked problem because uh, cities themselves are complex systems with networks of actors and stakeholders, also networks of institutions coming together with complicated and contrasting, sometimes conflicting interests, priorities that uh, actually don't really allow for the stereotypical and classical linear uh, solutions, top-down planning or circular planning. Um, so what? how do we actually address this complexity? How do we deal with it uh, and make the best of this opportunity? So this is where fundamentally the idea of corporate action comes in. But it's not us saying it, it's actually um, the result of a very in-depth uh, consultation process that we conducted for the last 12 months. Here you can see kind of a geographical representation of this consultation. We've involved more than 125 institutions in this process across the globe. We conducted three regional workshops, uh, one in Latin America and one in Africa, another one in Southeast Asia, South Asia. And we've involved donors, research institutions, uh, city networks, practitioners. Uh, those more than 125 consultations, but also we've invited uh, in-depth case studies, um, out of which basically we selected eight of them that fundamentally gave us a very good insight of what actually some um, some organizations are doing on the ground, where what kind of interventions they are actually implementing in relation to co-production and urban resilience. Generally, these consultations basically covered three main topics, right? We asked uh, about the context that they were actually implementing or dealing with. We asked of the particular type and methodological approach of their interventions. And we asked as well, the kind of impacts that they achieved, the type of challenges that they faced to have a kind of general understanding of, you know, what actually works in what kind of context. All right, this, um, this, uh, this consultation gave us many insights, but I want to highlight um, kind of three gaps that the, these 125 organizations brought us to the table, which really drives and directs our work. So number one is basically the importance of context specificity. And of course, this is something that we have heard so much. You know, it's not going to surprise anyone on on this uh, kind of um, in this conference in this session. Um, but really, basically, many of our participants uh, suggested that other interventions that have just basically figure out mm, particular kind of types of solutions then sometimes fail actually. But then on the other hand, you have other participants of this uh, consultation that suggested that actually we need to deal with this idea of resource constraint. So there's some kind of balance that needs to be kind of achieved um, and to basically be close enough to the context where we are actually intervening, but also attending to that limitation on resources that every program is actually constrained by. So second, and this is actually I'm putting it in the center because it's going to guide all our thinking um, and is connected to uh, the idea of context and specificity is the fact that power and politics, incentives and institutional setups is the kind of context that an intervention needs to be basically looking at if it wants to achieve impact. So that's actually very different in different places. You're going to have um, different types of relationship between civil society organizations, different, different relations between the state and those civil society organizations. Uh, different kind of power relations between different government departments or how the government relates to the private sector. And this is going to be so specific that if you just don't consider it, you're, you're more or less bound to fail. So we want to basically give a special attention to this. So keep it in mind because this is what comes right after. And the third point or the third gap that our work um, is a kind of directed to address is the fact that there's so many methods um, to basically facilitate co-production, but there's no so much kind of guidance in 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 relation to what method works in what context. And by works, we're talking about basically being effective, but also being sustainable, achieving long-term uh, uh, contributions towards urban resilience. So, with this in mind, 
we went away and we started thinking about um, co-production and um, drawing, of course, in an extensive uh, literature review. We basically uh, navigated all the literature uh, on sustainable studies, risk studies, and in, uh, uh, in, in, in common, uh, common management of common resources as well. Uh, and brought all these 126 organizations contributions to actually figure this out. But before I get into kind of the framework itself, I want to be very clear what we mean about, uh, about co-production. I think we've had our colleague Jesse and our colleague Liam basically talk about this, but I want to basically break it again to you. So for us, co-production means basically exploring or reframing complex problems, and this is specific in uh, valid for this urban context, which many have named as wicked issues, wicked context, uh, through dialogue and knowledge sharing uh, between a, a very diverse set of groups of uh, stakeholders. And here, this is going to be complex because these stakeholders might actually have conflicting visions of what means urban resilience, conflicting priorities or where to put a particular infrastructure to mitigate flood risks, for instance. So this is actually, it's not basically just a technical problem. It's very much kind of a political issue as well. But co-production brings us great potential as our kind of 126 organization brought to us. It can actually help if done well, basically. It can ensure that the diverse sets of stakeholders can actually influence decision making. So it's not just a tokenistic a participatory process, but actually a very diverse set of knowledges are able to, to influence decision-making. It can flatten power relations and asymmetries. And it also, as a consequence, I would say, it can, for the risk affecting most marginalized groups, to influence those decision-making processes and those planning processes. Why is this important? We argue, basically, of course, we're going to manage to get to a contextually relevant solution, but we are actually also going to manage to get a sustainable and equitable and impactful outcome of the process. All right, let me introduce you finally an overview um, of the framework itself. So it has three components. The first of all, of all is um, we call it domains of action. These are kind of the, um, kind of sectoral areas with, with which most organizations would actually feel comfortable. Um, some some of the organization would actually kind of feel close to one domain or another. Community assets like livelihoods or services. I don't know, like um, we're speaking, knowledge uh, and awareness may actually be related to early warning systems. Um, governance and planning may be actually very close to regulatory process that uh, uh, through which basically the government invites invites participation of civil society organizations, infrastructure, for instance, including transporting infrastructure or water distribution networks and finance uh, that may be actually traditional. You know how basically the municipal government is funded or very innovative through um, kind of crowdfunding, for instance. So the, the interest of these domains of action, which are kind of um, these five areas, these sectors, is because they they are kind of almost like a convenient space. They attract stakeholders in a city they, who has a mandate and who has resources basically to address issues around these five areas. But they also are going to be very important for us because they're going to bound this analysis that I'm going to propose, propose you uh, in a second. If you were going to address the complexities, basically, of power relations in the city as a whole, you might actually feel that this is too big a problem and you don't have the time. But when focusing narrowly around the domain of action, this becomes uh, much more manageable. How are we going to address this context analysis around a particular domain of action? And I'm going to start using an example here to illustrate. And um, this example is coming from extensive work I've done in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, where I've conducted research for the last seven years. Let's say that our domain of action is an infrastructure, particularly it is a kind of a highway that is going to or was going was going to be kind of uh, built 
to connect a new uh, um, international airport with a business and administrative center in, in the city to accelerate basically the transit of um, uh, international investors and also um, the exports of uh, commodities uh, and connecting Dakar with regional and global economies. So we, we argue that actually to um, produce these contextual uh, in contextually relevant urban resilience uh, programs through co-production uh, processes, we need to understand networks of actors in the city and networks of institutions in the city that have the capacity to make decisions and drive basically the development of this particular infrastructure project. And for that, for understanding what networks have power to make decisions, we suggest that we have to cover three main areas of analysis. We need to understand the institutional context, the cultural context, and the biophysical context. And let me give you two uh, lines around each of those. Um, so if we're going to basically look at the institutional context, this means mapping actors and institutions uh, across the public sector, sector uh, private sector, the businesses, the civil society organizations, um, and also research institutions in country that have the capacity to influence the, the very, the domain, particularly this kind of infrastructure development, this highway that we are building. Here, in this exa example, this would mean basically um, government departments that are responsible at national level, development authorities that are responsible for that infrastructure, it would also mean, uh, in this particular context, in this particular example, a couple of civil society organizations that were particularly interested um, in actually influencing the design because the road itself was going to be cutting across informal settlements in the city. And it will also include understanding how, for instance, a kind of international consultancy firm like McKinsey was going to produce impact assessment that were going to influence that infrastructure development. Here you very quickly see that there is a network of government, of the private sector, and um, this kind of consultancy firm that are coming together and not allowing these civil society organizations putting forward their views of how the highway is going to affect the city. We might also want to understand how the cultural context um, is, is, is actually shaping these decisions. Here is by culture, we refer to um, the informal norms that are also very relevant. So things like gender, caste, ethnicity might actually influence very much who has the power to influence decisions, who have the power to influence the planning of that highway. Uh, highway. So that's also important for us. And the biophysical context itself is, in this case, basically, we refer to kind of um, uh, disaster events like recurring floods that not only are disrupting the city, but they are also inviting uh, the city to reflect and integrate the risk of certain groups. With increasing floods in Dakar, this opened a window of opportunity for informal settlers, for these people living in the areas where the road was going to build, be built to kind of influence the infrastructure design. Okay, so now we have mapped these networks uh, through these kind of three areas. And this, in our framework, opens the possibility for a lead organization like yours, uh, basically to decide um, what kind of intervention is best suited. It might actually be a behavioral change intervention um, that actually tries to change the behavior. And it can also be an empowerment intervention that bring together the civil society organizations, basically to be better place to influence the design of the infrastructure. It can maybe um, broker agreement between the civil society organization and the government. So a very punctual agreement around the project itself, or might be reforming the system, changing the rules of participation. So overall, our framework is going to give you basically a number of tools, both for analysis and also for deploying these co-production interventions um, uh, to integrate the analysis into the design of the co-production programs. And we argue that this very much is, um, is going to help you to produce contextually relevant and sustainable programs that will contribute to urban resilience.
Um, so just to finish, and in one second, how this actually works. So underpinning this framework is the idea that actually risk doesn't come from the space, actually. It is the result of urban development pathways. And I think this idea, you'll probably be very familiar with this, is coming from the IPCC. Development pathways produces risk, so you need to act on the drivers of these development pathways, which is very much these networks and these institutions and cultural context that we refer to. So by understanding these three areas, you will be able to identify the networks that operate in a city, its urbanization in a particular direction, and therefore the framework will allow you through its full component to tactically intervene and change the way the networks interact with each other. Um, what's next? So with this, we are now basically pilot, this, pilot testing our framework, uh, developing a, a number of other versions. One of them is uh, very focused around gender relations. Another one is around infrastructure design. And we're going to pilot this in cities in India and South Africa. And then we also want to, and we are uh, committed to uh, foster the dissemination and learning of this framework by informing programs, but also research goals like we are doing with FCDO and the UK government. Uh, we're also supporting that we will be supporting the development of internal guidelines. Uh, we're, we're discussing with organizations like C40 to do that. Uh, and we are also have also been invited to um, foster learning across a number of urban labs. So overall to produce a community of practice and a knowledge hub that brings all this kind of learning together about how this framework can be deployed. And we'll be delighted to work with you if you were interested. And for that, we're going to put forward uh, three questions that I would love if you could actually help us to um, kind of respond. The number one is basically I'd like to identify programs or initiatives uh, that are currently being implemented and are going to be implemented in the coming year. Uh, that are around this idea of corporate action or multi-stakeholder dialogues around urban resilience. So we can approach uh, those interventions. We'd like to also map uh, donors, practitioners, or networks of local government that might be interested in this approach. And also we'd love to hear um, your opinion about the framework, what is particularly useful and what is not so much. Thank you so much. And I now stop sharing and um, I allow basically for my colleagues to share the mirror and also open the floor for any comments and um, thank you very much thank you very much alejandro that was very very insightful um looking at the work and the details that i've actually gone into um the urban resilience framework i i if i own a city i think i'll take it on board and and, and run with it um but unfortunately, I don't. So I'm going to depend on the team and the expertise here to actually do that um, for us. Um, so we have a set of questions for the urban resilience, three sets of questions. Um, feel free to actually engage with those kind of questions um, as much. You can add your own responses. You can add your own comments to it. But more, we are looking at what could potentially be the next phase of the urban resilience um, um, document in terms of uh, um, the co-created work. How do you think we can best integrate it within already existing systems and programs and activities within the urban space? And I believe it doesn't just end with the urban space, there's more application beyond the urban space. And I think, it offers also an opportunity for us to explore in those particular areas. So the three main questions I'm going to go over again. Um, if you have any questions, please post it in, Alejand in, in the chat box and Alejandro would respond to it. Or you can pop your hands up. I think you can also we'll give you the opportunity to speak up. So questions, what's going, uh, what ongoing programs or initiatives are aware are you aware of that focus on facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue for urban resilience that we should reach out to? So fundamentally, embedding our, our urban resilience programs in already existing processes, we don't intend to reinvent the wheel. We want to actually strengthen the process, uh, the processes that are already ongoing, um, helping the processes to actually identify their strengths and their weaknesses and how to actually catalyze on those better 
um, what donors and practitioners and networks are working within the space of local government research organizations that could potentially, we could potentially partner to promote this. And this is also one of the things. So all our co-creation work, we are not just looking at problems, we are not looking at just limitations, but we are looking at the next phase. And that is how we have modeled this particular set of presentations to make sure that your inputs are as valuable as the presentation itself. So please feel free, um, share your thoughts on this. And the last question looks at what are the frameworks you could put, you found particularly useful? So again, there are quite a number of frameworks that emerged. And if you feel there are specific ones that you want to engage with, um, you can leave your contact with uh, or share your contact with us and we'll potentially also engage with you. If we want us to ring fence specific components of our framework that you think can be applicable to your organization's activity or programs, that will be useful. Then again, we can see how um, to engage with you moving forward and mobilizing the needed resource to see it being um, implemented and taken over. There's no idea that is too small. There's no idea that is too big. Feel free to share your thoughts. Um, Alejandro, do you have any last words, any last comments uh, before we draw the curtains to a close on your session? Mm, thank you very much for uh, part, for being here and participating and listening. I think um, I think just like put out there the um, what is coming for us. We are actually looking uh, to um, invite organizations that are currently engaged with um, uh, co-production interventions for urban resilience uh, and engage and engage them in a uh, um, community of practice, so we can actually learn and compare what works, what kind of methodologies work in what context and, and further refine this in the coming year. So um, please reach out to me. I put my email on the chat box. Perfect. Perfect, Alejandro. Um, I can see most people are actually busy on the mirror board right now. Let's give them some few minutes um, as they actually complete or make their inputs. Um, Thank you so much. Um, we are, will be wrapping up shortly. Um, we are almost on time. Um, I would invite my head of secretariat to actually give us a bit of a wrap up. Um, the way forward in how to actually envision some of these engagements. Uh, what are the opportunities that ARA potentially is coming up with? Um, and and, and um, we, will, we would invite um, Morgan to give us the vote of thanks and potentially end. Um, Jesse, some few lines before we wrap up, please. Great, thank you very much, Kweku. Um, I mean, really from my side, all I wanted to do was to thank everyone here for your participation. We see the, the three uh, mirror boards that we have are really filled up with inputs from all of you. So thank you very much. Um, we intended this session to, of course, share a bit about the ARA, the work that we have been doing on co-creation and sharing a bit of our perspectives, as you've heard in each of, of the presentations, as well as the initial framing. Um, but also, I really just want to also highlight here that we um, will be using these inputs. So it's not just an exercise where we're asking you for thoughts and, and leaving them there, but we're actually taking everything you're putting onto these boards and we'll move them forward um, in next steps. So, for example, some of the the potential networks or funders to engage with, you know, some of them we have engaged with, some of them we haven't. So we'll definitely take these on board for recommendations and really help us to, to see kind of the next steps for each of these co-creation processes. Um, this board will be open for the rest of the day. So please do continue to input just because we're closing this session here now. doesn't mean that it won't be open a little, a little bit longer today. So please do continue to add. Um, and really just say to thank you very much to Gobe Shona for the organizers of the session, but of course to the whole conference. There's a whole lot more to come here as we're just on day three or four, I think day four. Um, and thank you, of course, to UNDP and IAD and representatives for presenting. Um, it's really been, I think, uh, an excellent session to hear the different activities and also, like I said, capture everybody's inputs here on the middle board. So thank you very much. Um, and maybe Morgan, then, is there something you'd like to come in with here too? Finish us off. 
Thanks, Jesse and Kweku. No, I think you covered all the bases. Um, yes, just extending another thank you um, for joining us here today. And the recording will be made available. And yeah, please do continue to populate the mural board. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. We look forward to collaborating again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the sum up. Um, and thank you so much for being such a lovely audience. We had such a great turnout. And thanks to the Gumbashana team for being such amazing um, technical support. Thank you to the ICLI, um, I said ICLI team, um, the ARA team and, and, and South South North team for the support given so far. Uh, I really appreciate every step, every input. And thank you. Have a lovely afternoon, evening and um, morning in some parts of the world. <laughs> can we have a quick uh, screenshot before we close the session? Yes, yes, a screenshot. Um, okay, then please can you just uh, turn your camera on so yes. that we can have the screenshot? Okay, please turn on your cameras um, for the screenshot. I think we need to stop sharing screens, Jesse. Okay, perfect. Um, I think we have some few faces for well, that. Please turn on your cameras and let's have a screenshot. Excellent. Which one is... Excellent. Wait for me. We should wait for you. We're waiting for you. Please turn on your camera. <laughs> awesome. All right. So one, two, three. Please take the screenshot. Um, I think we have two main blocks here, so we move to the next one and take the next screenshot. Um, yeah, please turn on your cameras, those of you who have not turned on your